It is the World Wide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Broadcasting from coast to coast. City to city, coast to coast. It's time for the Ryan Hickey Show on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. If it's happening in sports, it's being talked about right here. And here's your host, Ryan Hickey. Good Thursday morning. Welcome into the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It is the Ryan Hickey Show with you until 11 a.m. Eastern. The next two hours going around the world of sports. A lot to get into. As always, conference championship weekend in the NFL. A few days away. That's it. A few days away from knowing who's in the Super Bowl Um, and getting ready for at least one last football game to wrap up 2020. So get you ready for that. Give you the winners, at least uh, who I think is going to go on and win this weekend. We'll do that. Phillip Rivers, we'll get to him in uh, about 15 minutes or so. Phillip Rivers hangs it up, calls it a career, an incredible career. Very successful, 17 years. Goes down as one of the league leaders in passing yards all time, in passing touchdowns all time. But I will say this. Being basically now 24 hours since the news of Phil Rivers retiring, there's really been one talking point. Is he a Hall of Famer? Is he not a Hall of Famer? I want to get into that in a little, you know, into that conversation. But at the same time, I do want to talk about Phil Rivers' Hall of Fame candidacy from more of a perspective of us, the watching audience, us, the fan, and how our Hall of Fame standards need to be raised. I'll tell you what I mean 15 minutes or so from now. The Nets... Big three. All right, we had the James Harden trade last week. He made his debut on Saturday. But for the first time, we had the big three of Kyrie, KD, and Harden all on the floor at the same time. Did not go as they expected. They lose to the Cavaliers in double overtime. We'll get to that. Two concerns I have coming out of that game. We'll do it at 940. Top of the second hour. We didn't get to this on Monday, so I want to get to it uh, today. Professional sports owners need to be held accountable. What is going on in Houston with the Texans and Deshaun Watson specifically? is horrible for the league, horrible for fans, horrible for any professional sports leagues. And guess what? It is time for owners in any sport to be held accountable for their actions, and in this case, for the Texans and Cal McNair, their owner, basically single-handedly driving Deshaun Watson out of town. We'll get into that. Speaking of Deshaun Watson, top five trade destinations. You heard in this show, we did it a few weeks ago, how I made the argument, and I still believe it, any team... If, or I should say this, if Deshaun Watson does become available, every team outside of the Chiefs should be making a call. I think to me, the Chiefs are the only team in the NFL that has an excuse that could justify saying, hey, Deshaun Watson wouldn't be an upgrade. I think every other team, because of age, production, consistency, he would be an upgrade at every of the other 30 current quarterback jobs on the other teams right now. But, so if we look at it from more of a, an outside perspective, right, which teams couldn't benefit from Deshaun Watson. I want to look at this from Deshaun Watson's point of view. If he is to get traded, where would be the top five destinations for him? Richard Sherman, we'll play that sound for you in an hour. He had his thoughts uh, and one team that stood out to him specifically. If you're a fan of a team in the New York area, you'd be very happy to say or hear what Richard Sherman said. We'll get into that. And finally, it's a Thursday. It's the NFL season. Hickey's Pickies. Liam Naranjo, my guy, coming on. With a chance to do something only one person has done in, Hickey's, in the history of Hickey's Pickies. Go perfect. Two games, sure. But guess what? No one has gone perfect outside of Lauren Clark. Perfect 5-0. and She started off. No one's come close. But hey, two games. Lane goes 2-0. and That's still a zero in the loss count for him. So we'll get to that finish show as well. As a reminder, we're coming to you live as you always are from the Big Italy Pizzeria Studios. Those great pizza, hot heroes, and phenomenal dinners. Check out Big Italy Pizzeria in person in Medford, Joe's Pizzeria at Bayshore, or online anywhere at BigItalyPizza.com. So I do want to start and just preview the games, right? The, the biggest storyline, at least in my mind, heading into this weekend, conference championship weekend in the NFL. Buccaneers at the Packers to start it off, followed up by the Bills at the Chiefs. Two incredible games Two incredible matchups, four awesome quarterbacks left. So, who's going to win? Who is going to advance to the Super Bowl? We'll start in the NFC. Packers, Buccaneers. To me, I think the Packers are going to the Super Bowl. Why? My biggest reason, 
the biggest overarching factor in my mind is why of why Green Bay is going to win, why they're going to take down Tom Brady and Tampa Bay, is because no defense is capable right now of slowing down this Green Bay offense. I want to take you back one week. Go back even less than a week, actually, to Saturday. Because the Los Angeles Rams went, went into Lambeau Field in the divisional round to take on the Packers. The Rams took with them into Lambeau the best defense in the NFL. Heading into that game, they were the number one total defense in the NFL, allowing just 281 yards per game. That's it. Just 281 yards per game. They were also the number one passing defense in the NFL, allowing just 190.7 yards per game. Number three in rushing defense, allowing just 91 yards per game on the ground. And number one in points per game allowed, 18.5. Best total defense, best passing defense, third best rushing defense, number one in points per game allowed. Incredible. There's, there's no weakness for this Rams defense, right? Well, that didn't matter to Green Bay. That didn't matter to Aaron Rodgers and this offense. Because guess what the Packers offense did last week to the Rams? They totaled 484 yards. 200 yards more than the Rams have allowed this season. The 484 yards the most of the Rams have allowed this year. Aaron Rodgers threw for 296 passing yards. Most allowed by the Rams this season. Aaron Jones in the run game combined for 188 rushing yards. Most uh, allowed by the Rams this season. Do you sense a, a trend here? Do you sense a pattern here? And the Packers scored 32 points, second most allowed by the Rams. Bills got 35 back in week, I believe it was two, or week three. Most total yards, most passing yards, most rushing yards, second most points scored on Saturday against the number one total defense, number one pass defense, number three rush defense, number one points per game defense. It doesn't matter who is lining up against Aaron Rodgers, Devonta Adams, Aaron Jones. They are producing. They can't be stopped. According to ESPN Stats and Info, this is, this is a great stat. So this matchup, right, because the Rams, as I just mentioned, number one defense in the NFL. Well, the Packers are the number one scoring offense in the NFL. This was the 22nd time in NFL history that the number one defense, or the number one scoring defense, excuse me, faced off against the number one scoring offense in the playoffs. 22 times in NFL history. The Packers scored 32 points. That was the fourth most ever in those matchups. So Green Bay's offense, doesn't matter who's on the field, doesn't matter who they're facing off against, they are having success. Part of the reason for their success is their balance. It is so tough to slow down Aaron Rodgers, even tougher when you have the run game to worry about. Because in addition to scoring all those points and getting all those yards, what also the Packers did on Saturday was have a balance on offense that made the Rams always on their toes, didn't know what was coming. Packers attempted 36 passes. They ran the ball 36 times. That balance is what makes Aaron Rodgers and this passing attack so lethal and so deadly. Because you are so concerned about stopping Aaron Rodgers that guess what? When you are playing pass defense, when you are dropping seven back, they're just going to run the ball with Aaron Jones. And they did so with a lot of success. That offensive line is moving bodies left and right. And just then when the Rams started selling out to stop the run, boom, Aaron Rodgers hit him over the top of the pass. That's what That balance is what makes Aaron Rodgers so deadly. So best of luck to Tampa Bay next week, or next week. Best of luck to Tampa Bay in a few days, I should say. And now, I understand they played earlier this year back in week six, right? And I understand Tampa Bay had their way. The Packers jumped out to a 10 nothing lead. It went sideways very quickly. Bucks won 38-10. Aaron Rodgers had just a brutal day. 16-35, 160 yards, two interceptions. One of those returned for a touchdown. So sure, we could look back and say, man, that Tampa Bay defense had no problem slowing down this Packers offense earlier this year. Why can't they do it again? Well, I'll say this. This offense right now is not the same offense the Buccaneers faced back in Week 6. Ask the Rams, who again came in with the best defense in the NFL by far and still had no answer for Aaron Rodgers. Still had no answer for Devonta Adams or Aaron Jones. So that's why I'm picking the Packers. Not to mention, 
not only you know uh, do I not see the, the Buccaneers defense slowing down this offense, the weather plays a Green Bay's factor. It's going to be 28 degrees right now with currently a 50% chance of snow. Maybe I'm overblowing this fact, but I have a hard time seeing a warm weather team, a team currently right now practicing probably in 75 degree weather down there in Tampa Bay, going up to Lambeau and faring well in frigid temperatures. I understand Tom Brady played with New England for 20 years and he knows what it's like to be in the cold, but a lot of that roster does not know what it's like to play in the cold. So the weather on the Green Bay side, that helps a little bit. But to me, this offense, so lethal, so deadly, so hard to slow down because everything's working right right now. I don't see Tampa Bay slowing down this Packers offense. That's, to me, why I think the Packers are going to the Super Bowl. So they are representing the NFC. And the AFC, Bills and Chiefs. This game, to me, comes down to trust. And in saying that, I trust the Chiefs in a big spot to get the job done more than I trust the Bills. So that's why I'm taking Kansas City to win. I understand Patrick Holmes in concussion protocol. Things are looking good, but still, we'll see if he's actually limited on Sunday at all. If he can clear the protocol, can he still play like Patrick Holmes that we know of, or will he be limited in the game? Even with that said, we've seen the Chiefs be in the spot multiple times. We've seen him get it done. I trust Kansas City when facing adversity yet again to get the job done. Because what did we see just last year? This team faced adversity in every single playoff game they played in, and they overcame it every single time. Right? Let's not forget. I mean, this was not an easy road to the Super Bowl for the Chiefs last year. The first playoff game, they had the bye. They go to the division round against the Texans. Before you can even sit down on your couch, right? If you're a Chiefs fan, maybe getting the chips ready, getting some dips ready, maybe crack open a beer. Before you even sit down, it is 24-0 right out of the gate. You blink. It's like, holy, what are we doing here? 24-0, 24 nothing, bang, just like that. What happened? They had to leave before halftime. Down 24 nothing, no problem, before halftime was even, even, or before they even got to halftime, I should say, the Chiefs took the lead. Next week, I see Tyler getting against the Titans. They fell down by 10 early. That is the recipe for disaster, right? That, that is playing right into Tennessee's hands. They got an early lead, run Derrick Henry, drain the clock, and that's how they beat the Patriots in the wild card round. That's how they beat the Ravens in the second round. Didn't matter. Down 10. No worries. Mahomes got it. Chiefs won. How about being down 10 in the Super Bowl halfway through the fourth quarter against a great, tremendous, aggressive 49ers defense? Doesn't matter. Mahomes got it. This offense got it. Andy Reid's got it. And they won all three games, obviously, en route to getting the Super Bowl victory. So they faced adversity in the past and have come out and prevailed. So I trust they'll be able to do it again. I mean, hell, they already did it last week. Mahomes goes out a quarter and a half left in the game. And Chad Henney's coming in? Yeah, that's adversity to win the game. Having a fourth and one in your own end and and Andy Reid trusting Chad Henney to get the job done. That's why I trust this team. Because even when the best player on the planet goes down, the game is in doubt. Team is their back up against the wall. Where you're only by five a touchdown, you probably lose the game. Defense got to stop. And Chad Henney came through and led the Chiefs on the biggest drive of his life to ice the game, run out the clock. So I trust Andy Reid to put this team in a position to succeed offensively and score enough points to win the game. Whatever they got to do. Let's just go back earlier this year. Bills Chiefs. Chiefs won that game 26 17. Why is that important? Why am I going back to that game in week six when I just referenced a week six game between the Buccaneers and the Packers and said that doesn't really matter? I'm bringing up that week six um, Bills Chiefs game for this reason. The Bills were adamant on not allowing Patrick Holmes to beat them. They were dropping guys left and right. They were trying to double Tyree Kill, double Travis Kelsey, saying, You are not beating us. And guess what? It worked. The only issue is they couldn't stop the run. Andy Reid said, fine, you want to take away the passing game? We will just beat you down with the run. They ran for 245 yards. They went away from their identity of a high-flying, aggressive, prolific passing offense and instead decided, you know what, for this game, we got to run the ball. Our best uh, threat, our best chance of winning is riding Clyde Edwards-Alaire. And they did that, and they won the game. 
So I'm not saying the Bills in this spot can't overcome adversity, can't really change their stripes, if you will, to, to cater their offense to whatever is working in the game. I just trust personally the Chiefs more in this spot. With all the offensive firepower that they have, with the genius game planning of Andy Reid, with Patrick Holmes being out on the field, I trust the Chiefs more in this spot. I'm taking the Chiefs to win this game. So I'm curious your thoughts. Who do you have winning? Love to get your thoughts. Facebook, if you want to comment on the live stream, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Boom, click on the live stream and comment right there. Twitter, you can follow us at WWSRN underscore radio. WWSRN underscore radio. Boom, there's a live stream. You can comment on, on the Periscope. You want to tweet me directly at Ryan Hickey Show. Also take your tweets, no problem at all. Who do you have winning the Super Bowl in your mind? Who is advancing? Who is winning this weekend? Facebook, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. So we'll get your thoughts. We'll get your winners. And when we come back, Philip Rivers retired yesterday. An illustrious crew. We will, we will discuss Philip Rivers. But also, I want to get on the public here. I want to get on people like you and me. Because our Hall of Fame standards as fans need to improve. I'll explain what I mean next. It is the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it, it's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back Welcome to the back Ryan Hickey, Hickey Show. Show. Right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And welcome back into the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network, taking you until 11 a.m. Eastern, as we always do every Monday and every Thursday. We appreciate listening on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, Worldwide Sports Radio Network, on Twitch, Worldwide Sports Radio Network, or most importantly, we really appreciate if you're listening or watching on our app, WWSRN on iOS, Worldwide Sports Radio Network on Android. Super simple. Download the app every single show that goes live. You, know, you get a notification every single article that's posted. You can check out everything that is done on the Worldwide Sports Network. Every single great show we have. Easy. Down to the wire. Below the mic, both hosted by our, our great pal, Aero Marks, who you, heard, you hear a lot on this show. Weapons hot. Our guy CJ Simone called on Monday. That's every Sunday for you Jets fans. And we'll get to the Jets here in about an hour, Deshaun Watson trade destinations. Richard Sherman says, hey, Jets, that's a spot for Deshaun Watson. Falco takeaway. We have a, a lot of tremendous and talented people working at the Worldwide Sports Network. So good news. You download the app, boom, it is all there at the click of a button. WWSRN and iOS, Worldwide Sports Radio Network on, uh, on Android. Excuse me. So the question we're asking, what we were starting with here, who in your mind is going to the Super Bowl? AFC title game, Bills and Chiefs. NFC title game, Buccaneers and Packers. Who is winning? I'm taking the Packers because no defense, especially the Buccaneers defense, can slow down what the Packers are doing right now. Rams brought the best defense into Lambeau Field last week. Not hyperbole, not exaggeration. That was the best defense in the NFL in 2020. And they got shredded. Most total yards allowed, most passing yards allowed, most rushing yards allowed, second most points per game allowed for the season. In that game, as Aaron Rodgers had himself a day, Aaron Jones couldn't be stopped. Devontae Adams with a touchdown. Things were, were moving and grooving for Green Bay. So I'm taking the Packers to go to the Super Bowl. And I'm taking the Chiefs to go to the Super Bowl. I trust them in a big spot. They've overcome adversity all through the playoffs last year. They overcame adversity just last week with Patrick Mahomes going out and Chad Henney needing to come in for a quarter and a half to save the day. Or save the season, I should say. Save, forget to save the day. Save the season. They lose that game. They're on the couch right now. They're like me and you watching this game this weekend. So I trust the Chiefs to get it done yet again. I think it's going to be a Chiefs-Packers Super Bowl. Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes. Oh, maybe first one to 50 wins that game. That's going to be a lot of fun. A lot, a lot, a lot of fun. So if you want to chime in, you have your thoughts, you have your predictions on who's going to win. Facebook, you can comment on the live stream, Worldwide Sports Radio Network is where you can find our Facebook page. Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio, WWSRN underscore radio. You can tweet us there directly. You can comment on the live stream that's on Twitter right now, which is our, our Periscope feed. You can comment right in there. You want to tweet me directly at Ryan Hickey Show. 
at Ryan Hickey Show on Twitter. You can tweet me your, your predictions as well. We'll read those on the air. Before we get out of here in an hour and a half at 11 Eastern, I do want to get into some big news that happened yesterday, and that is the legendary quarterback, right, an all-time great, one that will go down in history books, um, Philip Rivers hangs it up after 17 years in the NFL, 16 in, in San Diego slash Los Angeles, one with the Colts this past season. He decided to hang it up. He retires. A little bit of a surprising move to me personally, especially as a Colts fan. I actually kind of expected with the way things are treading, with the way Chris Ballard, their general manager, was talking, with the way Frank Reich was talking, I honestly thought Philip Rivers would be back next year. That is not the case. He is retiring. And now questions and discussions about his legacy have started to get brought up. Is he a Hall of Fame quarterback? Will he get it? And I, I want to use Phil Brewers as the example, but use it to talk about a bigger point. And that, to me, personally, is just Ryan Hickey talking. I'm not a, a Hall of Fame voter. I probably never will be. I don't have any credentials for that at all. But being a fan, right? we, we watch these games. You're a fan. You watch these games. You've seen Phil Rivers throughout his career. We've seen other great players now, especially getting to the age I am where I'm watching more sports than ever. You, you see a lot of these great careers starting to come to an end. And I feel like I can personally comment on people's careers and, and their credentials to the Hall of Fame better than I ever really could have. Because now guys that I've watched my entire life are, are hanging up. And when it comes to Hall of Fame credentials, when it comes to Hall of Fame voting in general in any sport, baseball, football, basketball, but obviously specifically football here, I personally feel our standards as the public, our standards as fans, when discussing is this player a Hall of Famer, is that player a Hall of Famer, is this good enough to get into Hall of Fame, are these stats good enough? I personally feel our bar for the Hall of Fame as the public, as fans, has dropped. And I personally don't like that. In my mind, now you may disagree, which is fine. I'd love to hear your reasoning and your rationale as to why Philip Rivers is a Hall of Famer, if you believe so. So I'm using him as the example here, but I don't want to use this whole segment to kind of bash Philip Rivers. But the Hall of Fame, in my mind, should be reserved for the best to ever do it. The elite of the elite. Right? Like it's, it's a club. It's a fraternity, if you will. To me, I'd only want the best people in there participating. The best to ever do it. And with that said, the more we just kind of allow guys in, oh, yeah, he was good enough, the, the more we allow very good, pretty good players in, to me, it personally waters it down. It's insulting to those greats who are already in. And now, in a statistical revolution, in baseball, in football, where it's easier to hit home runs in baseball, where it's easier to throw for passing touchdowns and throw for more yards and score points on offense. So statistics, you know, can be used as a supporting argument for sure. But they shouldn't be the first, and they should not be the only barometer for whether a player is a Hall of Fame candidate or not. And part of that, to me, the statistical revolution, or I guess not even the revolution, the statistical increase with every single player that's retiring now, you know, topping greats. Like Phil Rivers, for example. Fifth in passing yards, fifth in uh, most touchdown passes. Great stats. But those shouldn't be the barometer for getting in because now it's easier to throw for more passing yards than ever. It's easier to throw for touchdowns than ever because the way the rules are, the way the athletes are, the way it's, it's just hard to play defense, the way the game has shifted to an offensive-minded game. So to me, to me, what should be considered the most is how the player played in that era. How they stacked up to other quarterbacks that they played with. Not guys in the past, not comparing Philip Rivers' stats to Dan Marino or Joe Montana or Joe Namath or John Elway. But comparing Philip Rivers' stats, comparing his place in the game to guys that he played with. Because let's go for what it is. Philip Rivers in the era that he played with, from 04 now to 2020. He was a very good quarterback in his time. I'm not going to, again, sit here and try to disparage his career, tell you he sucked. He was a very good quarterback. He was better than Eli Manning. He was better than a lot of guys to play the position. But at the same time, was he ever elite? Was he ever a top five quarterback during his era? My answer is no. And look, it's unfortunate for him that he played in the same era as Tom Brady, as Peyton Manning, 
as Ben Roethlisberger, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Russell Wilson. It just stinks that some of the best quarterbacks we've ever seen are playing the game right now. It, it stinks. It's awful. I feel bad. But at the same time, you have to compare Phil Burrs' career to those guys because those are the gold standard. Those are the, the Hall of Fame quarterbacks that once they retire are going to be in. Hey, can we honestly sit here and say Phil Rivers was on the same level as Tom Brady? He was just as good as Peyton Manning. He has just as much talent as Aaron Rodgers. Drew Brees, Russell Wilson, Big Ben. You can't say that. He didn't transform the game, right? Defenses weren't changing what they were doing because of the way Phil Rivers played. He didn't dominate in his time to, again, where the Chargers are one of these teams that it's you can't knock out of the – or you can't get out of the playoffs. They have success. Can't stop the offense. He was never in the same category as a Brady, as a Manning, as a Rodgers. And sure, again, it's unfair maybe that he played in, in the best period that we've ever really seen quarterback play. It's only increasing. But at the same time, the Hall of Fame, again, should be for the elite of the elite, the best of the best. And if you are not one of the best, doesn't mean your career was a failure. Doesn't mean your career wasn't a, a, as impressive or, you know, wasn't as good. But it's just not Hall of Fame worthy. That's all. That's all. No, nothing crazy here. Like I said, sitting here as Phil Rivers retired yesterday, his stats are pretty. Fifth most passing yards in NFL history. Over 63,000 passing yards. Fifth in touchdown passes, 421. And right now, he currently has the eighth most wins of any quarterback, 139. Whether you want to use quarterback wins as a stat or not, people hate it, but I'm going to use it here. Top five in passing yards, top five in touchdown passes, top ten in quarterback wins for his career. So very impressive. Again, a very good career. But if your main argument for putting Phil Rivers in the Hall of Fame are those numbers, hey, he's top five in passing yards, top five in touchdown passes, we can't leave a guy like that out of the Hall of Fame. I'll argue with this. Because, like I said, the game has changed. Because it's easier than ever to throw the football down the field. Because it's easier than ever to throw touchdown passes, score touchdowns, score points. These records are only going to diminish and diminish quick. He's going to get buried in the record books very quickly now because guys like Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson and Josh Allen, if he continues to play the way he is, are going to eviscerate these records because, again, the talent is better, the rules are easier, and the offense, again, the game is geared towards offense. It's just a different time right now. So, yes, I understand he put up some great numbers. I'm not, again, here to try to disparage Philip Rivers' career because uh, it was an impressive one, and he doesn't deserve that on the day he retires, or I guess the day after, technically, now that he retired. But yesterday, a lot of discussion was, hey, what would Philip Rivers, is Philip Rivers a Hall of Famer? And the majority of people that I've seen said yes. Whether it's Twitter polls, whether it's just flat-out tweets, maybe it's just prison of the moment, hey, Philip Rivers retires, let's just, you know, we're going to hear all the feel-good stories, as deservedly so. But, you know, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling generous. Let's put him in the Hall of Fame. Like, that, that's not what this is about. It's not feeling generous. Ah, you know, he deserves to be in. Like, you know, he's one of those guys. Let's just give it to him. Throw him a bone. It should be reserved for the elite of the elite. Was Phil Rivers ever at any point in his career an elite quarterback? The answer is no. He was a very good quarterback. Unfortunately for him, never got to the Super Bowl, which, again, should is not... A disqualification. Only got to one AFC title game, which again is not a disqualification. But when it comes to elite, eliteness, when it comes to greatness, when it comes to matching up with quarterbacks of your era, Phil Burris falls short. So I'm not putting him in the Hall of Fame personally, but I've seen a lot of people that are. And I just don't get why we are continuing to water down Hall of Fames. I'd rather have less people get in that are deserving to get in than more players get in that we're looking at them and say, are they really Hall of Famers? No. 
I hate the Hall of Fame voting process, uh, especially for baseball. And these guys dangle for 15 years, and we put them in Iowa. Let's just put them in. This is the last year of the ballot. we got to get them in. This is the year. You're either a Hall of Famer or you're not. That's also another frustration. Right? You're either a Hall of Fame player or you aren't. Why are we going to just debate it for 10 years after the fact? Because guess what? Guess what? Guess what is not happening? On your 10th year of the ballot or your first year of the ballot? Your stats aren't changing. You're not all of a sudden throwing for more touchdown passes five years on the ballot compared to the first year. You're not throwing for more yards. You're not rising in the ranks uh, of history. But yet we see it time and time again. Oh, this is the last one. We got it. We got to get him in. If we don't do it now, it's never going to happen. Despite the fact that the first nine years or 14 years that they were sitting on the ballot, they, they weren't it. So again, this is more of a, a personal feeling. I'd rather have a stricter Hall of Fame than a looser one. Which is why I don't personally believe Phil Rivers is a Hall of Famer. But there's a lot of people that, that differ. A lot of people that go the other way on that and do think that he deserves to be in. So I'm curious your thoughts. You had a whole day to marinate. You had a whole day to sit on it, think about it. Is Philip Rivers a Hall of Fame player? Should he be inducted into Ken when it's all said and done? Facebook Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Twitter, WWSR Run underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter. You can tweet me directly right on the Periscope live feed, right on the Facebook live feed. Tons of different ways to interact with the show. So get your thoughts, and when we return, a new little basketball, sprinkle in a little NBA. Because the Brooklyn Big Three of KD, Kyrie, and Harden made their debut. The long-anticipated, or I guess long-awaited, much-anticipated, crush that, long-awaited, much-anticipated debut last night in Cleveland, and with a loss. Two concerns I have, I'll, I'll explain what those are next. It is the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it, it's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back Welcome to the back Ryan Hickey Show. Show. Right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And we are back here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. The Ryan Hickey Show with you until 11 a.m. Eastern. A lot of scuff to get into. We're previewing the, both the AFC and NFC title games. I have the Packers and Chiefs advancing to the Super Bowl. And Phil Rivers retired yesterday in a illustrious 17-year career. A lot of fun. A lot of viral moments from Phillip Rivers and a lot of his trash talking that went down. Is he all Hall of Famer? I say no, and personally, I think it's a challenge to the public, a challenge to us, the fans to raise our standards for the Hall of Fame. I believe, personally, they're too low because I saw a lot of people putting Phil Rivers in the Hall of Fame yesterday. Should be reserved for the elite of the elite, nothing more. So if you have any thoughts, Facebook, Worldwide Sports Radio Network, you can comment there in our live stream. Twitter, we're on Periscope, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You can tweet or comment on the Periscope live feed, I should say, or tweet us directly at WWSRN underscore radio, at WWSRN underscore radio, or tweet me, yours truly, directly at Ryan Hickey Show. So get your thoughts before we get out of here uh, at the top of the 11 a.m. Eastern hour. But I do want to get some basketball in here. We were turning to the NFL, top of the hour. Professional owners need to be held accountable. Deshaun Watson, top five trade destinations. And, of course, Hickey's pickies with my guy, Liam Naranjo, in an hour. But last night, a lot of excitement in the NBA. A long-awaited, much-anticipated debut as James Harden, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving all take the floor together for the first time for the Nets, end up with a loss, 147-135, an incredibly entertaining game, double overtime to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Watching that game, I have two concerns about this Brooklyn team going forward. If you remember, when the trade went down, when the Nets acquired James Harden last week, I told you, I don't think this team is going to win the finals, let alone make the finals. Didn't believe it. Didn't believe the trio would work. And at least, you know, in the, in the short term, the Kevin Durant, James Harden pairing worked. A lot of fun, a lot of high scoring. But now the trio is on the court. Two concerns I have coming out of that game that make, that make at least me feel better about my prediction that I don't think the Nets will win a finals or win a title, let alone make the finals. How much longer will the honeymoon last? And will the defense improve at all? Let's start with the defense end of the floor. 
that was phew, egregious. Right? That, that was, for people who have my line of thinking that this is not going to work, they are skeptical that the, that the Big Three in Brooklyn will win a title. One of the biggest errors they point to is defense. No doubt about the scoring. Like I said, they scored 147 points. I double overtime, but still, they scored a lot. James Harden, uh, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant. How are you going to slow those guys down? One of them down, let alone all three. But on the flip side of the floor, the question is, how are they going to guard anybody? How are they going to slow anybody down? And the answer is they're not. The defense isn't going to improve. They're not going to, go, they're not going to guard anyone. They're not going to lock any player down. Think about it. Cavaliers just scored 147 points last night. Entering this game, or after this game, I should say, do you know what Cleveland ranks in terms of uh, offensive rankings in the NBA? They are the second worst offensive team in the NBA, averaging 102.9 points per 100 possessions. Only the Knicks, the New York Knicks, are worse. So you let one of the worst offensive teams in all the NBA light you up for 147 points. Colin Sexton, obviously, as we know, explodes, goes off, unstoppable, especially in that second overtime. Couldn't be stopped. But as a team, the Nets also allowed Cleveland to shoot 51% from the floor. And they went 20 of 40 from three. 50%. So if they're getting toasted, if they are getting burned by the Cleveland Cavaliers, not the LeBron James of 2016-led Cleveland Cavaliers, not the 2015 Cleveland Cavaliers, but the 2020, 20, I guess really 2021 Cleveland Cavaliers. One of the worst offensive teams we've ever seen, this year at least. How are they going to get a stop when they go against teams that are actually good? When you're going against teams like the Bucs. I understand that they beat the Bucs a few nights ago. But in a seven-game season, are you going to consistently slow down that Bucs offense and just outscore them? I have my concerns. Now Kyrie Irving... After the game, talked about that defense. This is, this is Kyrie after the game, after they lost to the Cavaliers last night. Offensively, it clearly wasn't enough tonight. You know, we still needed to get stops on the other end. So that's going to be the tale of our season is how committed are we to that end of the floor moving forward. That gets me nervous. That is going to be the tale of our season. Can we get enough stops? Because offensively, no problem at all. 96 points, that trio combined to score last night. 96 of the 135. So like Kyrie just said, the offense isn't going to be a problem. But the defense is a legitimate concern. And if Kyrie is saying, which I think he's accurate, saying basically the defense is going to determine the fate of our season, I am not feeling confident about that. I am not feeling good that the Nets will, will turn it around defensively and figure it out. I mean, James Harden, postgame, basically echoed the same sentiment. Defense has to improve. We started off the game very, very, very good. It's the entire game, we just got to find a way to get stops when we need to. Offensively, they're not a, you know, statistically, they're not a very good team, but they made some shots tonight. So uh, we just got to watch some film get better and, uh, you know, chip away. One of the worst offensive teams, like I said, lit up the Nets. Now, look, maybe it's one of those nights – Maybe I'm sitting here overreacting to Colin Sexton going off, Cavaliers being unconscious from three, and just, you know, an aberration of night, if you will, where just everything was going right for the Cavaliers in this way. But this is also not a one-off here that all of a sudden is just going to, you know, get fixed quickly here. This is not a great defensive team to begin with that has a foundation of tough defense to start with. So I don't know how much better this team's going to get defensively. I don't. I don't really think there's much of a path here to improve. If you hear what Kyrie says, coming back from his first game from his absence, saying basically the defense is going to determine our fate as a team, who honestly is feeling confident that, yeah, you know what? These guys are going to figure it out. They'll be fine. Defense will come around eventually because it's not their calling card. And we were told, hey, th- this team is going to score, score, score. No one's going to be able to keep up with them. So def- who cares about defense? Right, who cares? This is an offensive-driven league. No one's going to be able to outscore them. So sure, teams will get their points. Teams will get their buckets. But we were talking about a, a KD, Kyrie, Harden trio 
what team is going to outscore them? Well, the answer is one of the worst teams, <laughs> one of the worst offensive teams in the NBA just did. So, yeah, that has me legitimately concerned. And also, speaking of kind of that defense, my, especially in the second overtime, we saw these guys were drained. Drained. Kevin Durant played 50 minutes last night of a possible 58 minutes. Kyrie Irving, in his first game back in two weeks, 48 minutes out of a possible 58 minutes played in double overtime. James Harden, 51. The lack of depth on this team when they traded away Karis LeVert and Jared Allen and Torian Prince. The lack of depth on this team is going to come back to bite them because if they keep playing all these minutes a game, your legs are going to get tired, and it's going to be a disaster in the playoffs. Like Kevin Durant's coming off a torn Achilles, and he's getting run out there for 50 out of 58 minutes. And it, there's not many other options. That's the issue. I, I believe the stat was they played the last 19 minutes of the game. So all of the first overtime, all the second overtime, in the last nine minutes of the fourth quarter, they didn't come off the floor. Those three, Kyrie, KD, and Harden. Which, again, you want to put your best players on the floor. I understand that. I'm not arguing against Steve Nash. My point is, though, when you trade away some legitimate depth pieces, some legitimate scores, there's not much wiggle room. There's, there's not much leeway for putting these guys on the bench and hoping that the bench mob can at least float and tread water until they return. That's also another thing. Colin Sexton went off in double overtime in part because Durant was drained. Kyrie was exhausted. Harden had nothing left because they played so much. That's an interesting story I want to keep watching as well. The more these guys play, with the lack of, of bench options to kind of, again, give them a break. I wonder as we get into April, as we get into May and the playoffs roll around, will these guys be fresh and have enough energy to get going? Because we know the playoffs are grueling. Will they have enough energy? Will they have enough stamina in the legs to keep going? So that's my, my first concern. Defense is not improving anytime soon. My other question is, I want to look, this, a look at this from the offensive side of the ball. How much longer will the honeymoon last? Right, because even last night, I don't know, it was a loss, but it was a, it was a fun, exciting game. You see Kyrie smiling. Both teams are going back and forth. The Nets make a run. Cavaliers come back and make a run. Boom, two threes from, let's say, KD. Boom, Colin Sexton comes back, a few threes. It was just a fun basketball game that was back and forth the entire time. And you saw Kyrie having fun. You saw, look like at least KD and Harden having some fun. It was all hunky-dory, we'll say. But like I said, all three had solid nights. Big three could buy for 96 points out of a possible 135 that the Nets scored last night. But I want to dive deeper, and what I mean by will the honeymoon last is this. I want to look at the shot selection that happened between the big three last night. Kevin Durant took 25 shots. Kyrie Irving took 28 shots. Both scored over 30 points. James Harden took just 14 shots last night. That's it. Just 14. Now, why is that significant? Because you look at James Harden's season average, he has never in his career since leaving Oklahoma City averaged less than 16 shots a game. So since he's been able to basically break away from, from Kevin Durant when he was in OKC, form his own team in Houston, he has never averaged in a season less than 16 shots per game. And he took just 14 last night. So here's what I mean by is the honeymoon or how long is it going to last? How long is... James Harden going to play point guard, if you will, but more of the passing point guard than a shooting point guard. How willing is James Harden going to be to being the third wheel in terms of shot selection, in terms of being the third option on most offensive sets? How long is that going to last? How long is maybe Kyrie Irving now some nights having to be the third option? How long is that going to last where these guys aren't disgruntled, are still getting along, still having fun, despite the fact that Every third night, if you want to just rotate, if you will, one of those guys will have basically a quiet night. One of those guys won't be featured. And these are all three alpha dogs. James Harden is a top five player in the NBA. He is used to, especially in Houston, used to taking the majority of the shots, being the guy. How long will it last when he is okay and satisfied with taking just 14 shots a game? even we saw in the fourth quarter last night, coming down the stretch, there was a few sets where he just took the ball up and he did it himself. He was not looking to pass. 
He was taking someone one-on-one. If he wasn't there, he's going to dribble out, start over. And you can kind of tell that, hey, he hasn't really gotten his chance throughout the game. He's taking it over. He's basically not giving the ball up because he doesn't think he's going to get it back. So how long is his honeymoon going to last where Kyrie is having fun playing with KD and Harden? How long is Harden going to have fun dishing it out to Kevin Durant, watching Kyrie take 28 shots where he takes just 14? I have a hard time believing that those three will have no problem basically alternating every third game who's going to be the, uh, the forgotten one, who's going to be the guy that takes a step back. Again, every, you know, you'll have off nights here and there for sure, and sometimes you're just not featuring the offense. But there's no doubt when Harden was in, was in Houston, this was his team. There's no doubt when KD, even when he's in Golden State, he was still the guy taking the shots. Well, they starting the offense. And obviously, Kyrie, wherever he's been, he's tried to be the focal point since he's left LeBron James, his Cavs team. So they accept being the third option more than they ever have been in their careers. I have my serious doubts, and I don't think so. So I'm curious your thoughts. You watched the Nets last night. What would you think? What were, what were your first thoughts with the big three of KD, Kyrie, and Harden debuting in their loss to the Cavaliers? Am I being too harsh on their defense? Can they fix it? Am I doubting their personalities too much to where, you know what, they'll be fine, they're friends, they'll figure it out, and they'll be fine with sharing the rock, not being featured every single night, and being a good teammate and saying, you know what, tonight's not my night, I'm going to feed Kyrie. I'm going to be okay if I'm James Harden taking just 14 shots. That's no problem. I have a hard time believing that's going to be going over okay. I do. So get your thoughts. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Twitter, WWSR underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter. When we come back, I want to get into the discussion. I want to have a Monday. I didn't have time. So I want to get into it today. Professional sports owners need to be held accountable. What is going on with the Houston Texans right now and Deshaun Watson is an absolute travesty, not only to the NFL, but to Houston Texans fans as well. So we'll discuss next. What happens? Why these owners have to be accountable? And what the hell is going on in Houston? We'll get to that when the Ryan Hickey Show returns right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Welcome back to the Ryan Hickey Show. Right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Welcome back in to the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Hour number two. As we are taking you to 11 a.m. Eastern. Coming to you live, as we always are, from the Big Italy Pizzeria Studios. Great pizza, hot heels, and phenomenal dinners. Guess what? Great news. You can get it all at Big Italy Pizzeria in person. Uh, if you're in person, I should say in Medford. If you're a little closer, Joe's Pizzeria in Bayshore or wherever you are. International. West Coast, you want some good pizza. Down South, you want some good pizza. Midwest, you want some good pizza. You can get it at BigGetOtherPizza.com. So a lot of discussions. We started off the show previewing the, both the AFC title game, the NFC title game. I'm taking the Packers because guess what? Guess what this Buccaneers uh, uh, defense can't do? Stop the Packers offense. Rams trotted into Lambeau Field last week with the best defense in the NFL. No hyperbole, no exaggeration. And still couldn't slow them down. Packers gained the most yards allowed by the Rams this season. They threw for the most passing yards. They ran for the most rushing yards. They scored the second most points on the Rams all season long. Just totally dominated Los Angeles. So I I don't see, to me, the Buccaneers defense making enough plays to slow down Aaron Rodgers. You're not going against Drew Brees. And his busted ribs, and now if you see his wife's Instagram post, his torn road trader cuff and a torn uh, fascia in his foot. It was a hobbled Drew Brees. He picked him off three times. This is not the same offense in Green Bay as it is in New Orleans. So I don't see how the Buccaneers are going to stop Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones, Devonta Adams. I think Packers roll on. Plus, 
going to be snowy. 28 degrees. I don't think the uh, the warm weather team down there in Tampa Bay practicing right now in 75 degree weather is going to have success in the cold. I'm taking the Packers, and I'm taking the Kansas City Chiefs to join them down there in Tampa. I trust Patrick Holmes. I trust Andy Reid. I trust this, t- uh, this Chiefs team. They faced adversity last year in every single playoff, uh, playoff game and overcome it. Overcame it. Terrible English today. I apologize. Overcame it. I think they'll do so again. But even last week, Chad Henney plays for a quarter and a half, and they still get the job done. So Josh Allen had a remarkable season, better than I ever could have imagined. I am a big Josh Allen doubter, as you are well aware. Come around. He's impressive. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. Bill's team has had a hell of a year. They are more legitimate than I could have imagined. I thought they were going to win the AFC East, but I wasn't sure about their playoff um, their playoff prospect. I wasn't sure if they were going to get a playoff win. I wasn't sure if they were going to make a run to the AFC title game like they did this year, but they have. Very impressive. Sean McDermott has a, a great team and a, and a great thing built down there in Buffalo. I just think the Chiefs are going to win. Chiefs Packers is my Super Bowl, to be honest. Uh, so that's what I'm picking. So love to hear your thoughts. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network, Twitter, WWSR, Ren underscore radio, at Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter if you want to tweet me directly there. So let's stick with football. I want to get into this topic on Monday. We didn't have time, so I'm very excited to get to it here. Professional sports owners needing to be held accountable. This hasn't really happened in the past unless it's just an egregious Donald Sterling S. act when he was the um, owner of the Clippers. Just something, whether it's illegal, distasteful, abhorrent, that's really, if it's outside of that realm, owners usually for the most part don't face any consequences when it comes to directly managing the team, right? Putting, picking the right players, putting enough resources for the team to be successful, Trying to build a winner. Usually owners are not responsible if that goes awry. If that fails. If they make the wrong moves. If they don't give their team the right resources. But to be seeing what's going on in Houston with Deshaun Watson and the Houston Texans right now. Where Cal McNair, the owner of the Texans, is basically single-handedly driving a wedge. Creating a divide between his franchise quarterback and the team. I think it's time for owners to be start getting held accountable and responsible when their actions directly impact the team in a negative fashion on the field. When they prevent their team from being successful on the field because of their actions. Fans deserve better. And it's time consequences start being had for owners that are bungling and butchering situations like Cal McNair is right now in Houston with his franchise quarterback, Deshaun Watson. So in case you missed it, in case you're not up to speed on the, on the full story, I'll quickly fill you in here. Adam Schefter. He's been reporting. Other NFL reporters have been reporting, but Adam Schefter dropped a bomb of late because there's been some distrust between Deshaun Watson and the organization. And really going back to last year when they traded DeAndre Hopkins. He was upset. They didn't really tell him. Didn't give him a heads up. They traded his best wide receiver. Got back essentially, you know, a second-round pick and an injury-prone running back. Great job, Bill O'Brien. Great job. But after the season was over, Deshaun Watson was preaching to the media. He said this in his press conference after the season. He wanted a coach in here that could change the culture. The Houston Texans needed a culture change. They, wanted, they needed a leader in the building that they could follow. That's what Deshaun Watson wanted. And instead, while well, he's on vacation, the Houston Texans, after asking for his input, mind you, Cal McNair, the owner of the Texans, went to Sean Watson and said, hey, we want your input. We want your thoughts here and a few candidates. What are you looking for in the next general manager? What are you looking for in the next head coach? Any suggestions, any thoughts would be greatly appreciated from the perspective of a player. So Deshaun Watson gave his thoughts, gave a few suggestions for general manager, gave him a few suggestions for head coach. Now, he didn't say these suggestions, but he saying hire them or I'm going to be out. There was no ultimatum. There was no declaration of, hey, hire these guys. Or I'm out of here. It was, this is what I think, you know, I'd love to have someone like this. You know, here's a guy like Eric Ganymi who has been named in reports that Deshaun Watson has vouched for. And instead, Cal McNair took those suggestions, wrote them down, it sounds like, and then threw them out. Deshaun, thanks for your time. As soon as it clo- you know, the, the door closes on Deshaun Watson leaving the office, boom, all the notes trashed. Let's do the complete opposite of what Deshaun Watson just said. Because guess what? 
They decided to hire Nick Casario, who worked for the Patriots, um, as general manager. Didn't tell Deshaun Watson. He found out, like me and you found out, social media. He got an alert on his phone. Hey, Texans are hiring Nick Casario. Imagine that, being the face of the franchise, and you find out a massive hire through social media. No one calls you. No one gives you a heads up. No one keeps you in the loop. So Adam Schefter, because this, this divide was created by Cal McNair, reported last weekend that the Texans, there are, there are multiple people in the organization, multiple people in the, in the Texans organization. It's not speculation. Or I guess I should say, I apologize. This is speculation, but this is from people who are in the know. This is not on the outside. This is people within the organization saying they believe Deshaun Watson already played his last snaps as Houston Texan. And ESPN's Sarah Barship, another you know, NFL reporter, she put out there and she was hearing that the Texans have already started discussing trade partners and potential replacements if Deshaun Watson was to be moved. And this all goes back to how Cal McNair has treated Deshaun Watson. Sending around this mysterious fellow named Jack Easterby, who has risen to power, apparently has the owner's ear, is making these decisions, but at the same time, he's a backstabber. There's a lot of distrust with him. Essentially, every single person on the inside of the organization and the outside of the organization sees this guy as a snake. That's what he is. He, he won a power struggle with Bill O'Brien. And he is now trying to keep his job and has the ear of the owner, Cal McNair. Everyone sees this guy as a rat, this guy as a snake, except for the most important person, the owner, Cal McNair. So he has caused this extremely toxic culture to cultivate down in Houston. And it's gotten so bad that even the snake, even if you cut, you know, what, what do you say? The best way to do it, you cut the... Cut the head of the snake. Cut it right off, right? That's how you end the issues. I just butchered that saying. I'm so sorry. Yeah, something like that. I, I totally butchered that. The saying, you know, you cut you cut the snake at the head. Even if they were to do that and you fire Jack Easterby, Chris Morton said via ESPN reported that that even would make Deshaun happy. The only way to make Deshaun Watson happy right now is that if Cal McNair fired Cal McNair, which as the owner, we know that's not going to happen. So this is my point, though. This is why professional sports owners need to be held accountable. Need to face some sort of consequences for their actions. Because an owner botching this situation with a franchise quarterback, with a quarterback in my mind, personally, I think 30 out of the other 31 teams would all have an argument to, to acquire Deshaun Watson. I think only the Chiefs could justify not trading for Deshaun Watson. He's a great person in the community. He's an awesome player on the field. He's a great leader. He's everything you want in a franchise quarterback. The Texans have that. And right now, Cal McNair is butchering this so bad. And the reason why there has to be accountability is because this is awful for the league. If you want to look at it from a a dollar's perspective, a cent's perspective, right? Because that's ownership, let's be honest. As an owner, you buy a team, for the most part, to make money. No owner in professional sports would be willing to lose money and win. If winning meant you were going to take a loss every year, no one is doing that. So sure, you want to win. You would like to win. Some owners are more aggressive in pursuing that than others. But the ultimate goal is it's an investment. You are making money. So let's look at that. Because the number one motivation is money. Cal McNair, what he is doing right now in butchering the situation, it's bad for the league because this is costing the league money. Because what you are doing is you are alienating right now a fan base in one of the biggest media markets in the NFL, Houston. A massive media market. Could you imagine if Deshaun Watson is traded? How are you, as a Houston Texas fan, going to root for this team, believe in this team, feel good about this team, have any hope going for the future? You can't. And what do we know? When apathy sets in, when fans stop caring, that's when the money goes down. Think about it. Think about why the NFL is so lucrative. 
It's so lucrative because we care. We, as, as Americans in this country, love football. We can't get enough of it. So we watch every game that's on. We treat every Sunday like, like it's a holiday. Off-season news. The off-season now, the NFL is a 365-day-a-year business. We care about the draft. We care about free agency. We care about OTAs and walk-through practices in May. There's always interest around the NFL 365 days a year that no other sport has. That's led to this league making hand-over-fist money. I think about it. The Texans franchise is worth $3.3 billion. It's not valued like that if we didn't care about football. If we didn't watch the games, we didn't go to the games, we didn't buy merchandise. So the money is there because we, the fans, as corny as this sounds, we, the fans, put the money in the pockets of the owners. So if you're Roger Goodell, and if you are in the business of the NFL, how are you happy, how are you more importantly allowing an owner of a team in a massive media market to solely drive a franchise quarterback out of the team. Can't do it. So that's why, it, it, to me, it's, it's in these leagues' best interest to have owners that care about winning more than anything else. As corny as it sounds, as maybe counterproductive of, of owning a team, because you, you do as an investment, as that sounds, it's what's best for the league, it's best for the fans, and in doing so, it's best for your pockets. Because let's be honest here. As soon as the fans go away, this league is done. If fans get fed up, stop watching, stop going to the games, you're screwed. You're soccer. And are soccer franchises in the U.S., MLS, are they worth $3.3 billion? No, they're not. So the main focus in owning any professional sports team, in my mind, has to be winning. Because you know why? Even if you're trying to win, even if you're putting the pieces in place, fans will go to the game. Fans will watch. Fans will be engaged. The second that stops, profits go down. As soon as fans stop watching the game, TV revenue goes down. And that means less money in the pockets of the owners, less money for the league. So I understand Roger Goodell works for the owners. So he's not going to sit here and say, Cal McNair, you got to sell the team. He's working for Cal McNair. But if you think about it in terms of health of the league and trying to placate the fans, having some sort of, uh, of punishment, some sort of penalty for butchering situations like this so brutally like the Texans are, has to happen. Because again, I brought this up before. Could you imagine being a Texans fan? You just saw the best wide receiver, one of the best wide receivers in the NFL, if not the best, in DeAndre Hopkins to get traded off your team last year for no reason, essentially. Maybe because, you know, Bill O'Brien was worried that they couldn't re-up him and pay him. So they, they traded him. So you traded, you know, a team that just went to the division round of the playoffs last year. You traded away the best wide receiver on that team. And now, a year later, your owner, not, not with something he said, not because he, he's trying to take the franchise in a different direction. Because he himself, with his actions and not knowing how to be an owner, not knowing how to have people skills, is driving a divide between the franchise quarterback that everybody loves and the team. So if you're a Texans fan, honestly, how can you sit here and root for the Texans in 2021? How can you put down a deposit for season tickets in 2021? When, when the hope, the savior that you had hoping that will one day lead you to win a Lombardi trophy has been traded away because your owner doesn't know what he's doing. That's bad for the Texans. It's bad for the league. So the tricky part here, and I admit, I don't have a solution. I hate bringing up issues without having solutions. But I don't know what the solution is because it is a slippery slope. It is very ambiguous how basically you punish an owner for not doing a good job compared to other instances where just unfortunately some bad things happen. If you're speaking directly in terms of player acquisitions, 
putting money into the team and trying to win. For example, last year I thought the Browns were going to go to the playoffs, right? I mean, some people thought they're going to go to the Super Bowl. The Browns hired the wrong head coach. Freddie Kitchens was not the man for the job. It failed epically, and they went six and ten and were laughing stock. Now, are we going to get on the Haslam family and punish them for hiring the wrong head coach? No. It's a slippery slope, I admit. But seeing what is going on in Houston, with it being so egregious and obvious that the owner single-handedly is ruining a franchise, to me, something has to be done. Something has to, someone has to step in and fix this. Because, honestly, how is this good for the league? How is trading away a, a star player in his prime to another market while, well, sure, those fans would get engaged? You are alienating a massive fan base down there in Houston. NFL is not in the business of alienating fans. They're not in the business of ruining good situations. And there's enough wealth in this country that if you force someone to sell, that team will be bought up in a second. That is not a problem at all. There is plenty of money at the top to go around to have someone else who wants to win, who wants to take this team in the right direction to step in and take over. Ownership shouldn't be a birthright. Cal McNair is dad on the team. Cal McNair obviously does not know what he's doing. He does not know how to be an owner. So why are we letting him ruin a franchise with one of the best players in the league in it? I don't, I, I don't get it. Personally, I don't get it. Now, it's easy, again, for me to say this as a fan. I don't have millions of dollars invested into a team. I don't own a team. But it's, to me, it's obvious that it's best for the league when all 32 owners in the NFL, 30 owners in baseball, 30 owners in the NBA, when their main motivation is winning. Let's look at baseball here quickly for a second. The owners are killing the game. Let's just not you know, forget the, the, the drama that played out this past offseason when trying to get a season going. The owners didn't want to pay the players. They wanted to pay them as little money as possible. So instead we had public fighting. It was embarrassing. We had a 60-game season. Owners are trying to suppress player salary. The the free agency period is boring as hell because no owner wants to pay money. And more are interested in shedding salary than they are trying to win the team, uh, win win the World Series. And that is awful for the sport because now you go into a season where there's like eight teams that are actually trying to win. The rest aren't. And apathy sets in. So I, I don't understand having or allowing owners whose main motivation isn't to win. Now, they may say when they buy a team, yeah, I'm going to try to win. But their actions over time will indicate that. And if not, if they aren't doing everything possible to win the game, if they aren't investing money into facilities, into players, into, into scouting, they are like Cal McNair and bungling a situation to where your franchise quarterback is doing nothing wrong and you, everything you say, every word you speak out of your mouth only creates a bigger divide and provides more motivation for him to get out of Houston. Something has to change. So I'm curious. Should owners be forced to sell? Should there, should there be some sort of rule where if you don't prioritize winning, if you're not doing right by your franchise in order to try to get them a championship, you should be forced to sell. But I said, punishment is the issue. It's a slippery slope. There's a lot of ambiguity when it comes to defining teams not trying to win versus teams trying to win that just don't have luck in trying to win. But should bad owners be forced to sell their teams? Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter. So get your thoughts on when we come back. We will stick with the Houston Texans. Deshaun Watson wants out. Adam Schefter reporting that, according to his sources, People within the organization believe that he has played his last snaps as a Texan already. And I made the argument, out of the 31 other teams in the NFL, if Deshaun Watson was to get traded, only the Chiefs could justify not trading for Deshaun Watson. That's it. Because the age, production, or consistency, every other team in the NFL, in my mind, could justify trading for Deshaun Watson outside of Kansas City. But let's look at, I want to look at this from the perspective of Deshaun Watson himself. 
Where would be the best landing spots for Deshaun Watson if he could control where he gets traded? I have five of my mind. I'll give you the top five when the Ryan Hickey Show returns right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back to the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And we are back here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. The Ryan Hickey Show, like you just heard from the Deep Voice Guy, until 11 a.m. Eastern, just about a half hour or so from now. So we just discussed Cam coming off of, of what is going on in Houston. Cal McNair, the owner of Houston Texans, single-handedly driving a wedge and, and a divide between Deshaun Watson, the franchise quarterback, and the Houston Texans franchise. It's gotten so bad, Adam Schefter, a well-respected NFL insider, is reporting that people within the Texans organization, people close to the situation themselves, believe Deshaun Watson has already taken his last snaps as a Texan. Things are not looking good if you're a Texans fan. So I'm curious, what is the best landing spot for Deshaun Watson? Where would he go to have the most success? Because we've already talked about this from the perspective of teams, right? I, I made the argument 31 teams should be interested or 31 teams out there that Deshaun Watson could get traded to. Every team outside of the Chiefs, in my mind, couldn't justify trading for Deshaun Watson. He'd be an upgrade for every other quarter position outside of Kansas City because of age, consistency, or production. But what about from his perspective? For Deshaun Watson's perspective, if you want to get traded, he wants to go to a place where he can win, right? I think it's fair to say, fair to assume. Where could he go to have success? Where could he go to win? Richard Sherman was on the Chris Co- or was on the Collinsworth podcast, excuse me. He had his idea of the best team that that's uh, that would fit Deshaun Watson. Here's what Richard Sherman had to say. Yeah, if I was Deshaun, I'd, I'd get out of there as quickly as possible. I'd head to New York. Um for the first thing smoking. The, G- the Jets? The Jets. How know. beautiful would that be? It would It would be the most beautiful. Uh, decent offensive line. They'd have to find threats. They'd have to, to, to find some offensive weapons. Um, but I think there would be a lot more people excited to be there. You know, I think the free agency market this year is going to be oversaturated because of the salary cap. Um, mm-hmm. But that's what I would do. I would, I, would, I would be out of there on the first thing smoking. I wouldn't give them, like they're saying, he's not answering any texts or any calls. I wouldn't either, you know? He's done. He's done everything. Like he's taken a beating for you guys and and played efficiently. Like not taking a beating and played bad and blamed it on a bad season. He went four and twelve and then threw the ball at seventy percent. I believe. Um, mm-hmm. Like he did. His level of play didn't drop with the team. Like he didn't. He didn't let the bad season say, "Hey, I'm going to be bad too. I'm going to be all pro level, and I'm just going to have to do everything I can to help my team win, and we're not winning." Richard Sherman, go to the Jets. The Jets, if Richard Sherman, in his mind, saying that's the best spot for Deshaun Watson to land. My guy Josh writes on Facebook, which team thinks the best chance of getting Watson sounds like the Jets to him. Jets have a, a lot of, of trade capital, a lot of draft capital. You know, If they want to include uh, Sam Donald in terms of, of a package, they could get him. But in my mind, if I'm Deshaun Watson, you could do better than the Jets. There are better options in the NFL than the New York Jets. So if I'm Deshaun Watson, if I'm sitting here playing the role of a three-time Pro Bowl quarterback, a national champion at Clemson, this is tough to do, tough, tough to do. But if I was him, I have five teams on my list that I would want to go to that at least in my mind give me the best option of winning, gives me the best chance to win multiple Super Bowls and have success unlike what I did in Houston. So here are my top five teams. I'll go in ascending order. So start at number five. The Indianapolis Colts. To me, when you look at the Colts, they are a quarterback away from being a legitimate threat to the Chiefs and winning a Super Bowl. Frank Reich is an aggressive head coach, a quarterback-centric offense that he runs. I think, personally, Deshaun Watson would have a ton of success. Him and Frank Reich would work together very, very well. Look at the team. This would be the best offensive line Deshaun Watson has ever played behind. Ever. He's not running for his life every single play like he was in Houston for the four years he was there. Frank Reich is adamant on running the football, having balance on offense, and having a back like Jonathan Taylor takes so much pressure off of Deshaun Watson's shoulders. So like you heard Richard Sherman say, the Texans were losing every game. They were god-awful this year. So they're throwing the ball more times than ever. There's no balance in the, in the Texans' offense. They have the second-worst rushing attack in all of the NFL this year. 
You go to the Colts, all of a sudden, they're running the ball a lot more, which means what? When you have success running the ball, it's less that Sean Watson has to do on his end, which is, you think he'd only be better for that. And you go to a franchise that has a ton of front office stability. I mean, they were able to withstand, with Chris Bowder's general manager, they were able to withstand Josh McDaniels living out of the altar, agreeing to come be the head coach, picking his assistants and his coordinators, and then saying, ah, you know what, I'm good, forget it. I, I take a thought, I take it back. With Stan Nath, found a great head coach in Frank Reich. Then, <laughs> a year later, had to deal with Andrew Luck, the franchise quarterback, the guy that was supposed to help get the Colts on the right track to win a Super Bowl. He retires two weeks before the season started back in 2019. He was able to withstand that. So you go to a franchise that is stable, unlike currently was with what's down there in Houston. And not to mention the kicker, the final piece. Why, if I'm Deshaun Watson, I want to go to the Colts. You get to play the Texans twice a year. You get to stick it to the organization that screwed it up two times a year. Get to rub their nose in that stupid decision they made to trade him. That's right to be I have the Colts at number five in terms of if I'm Deshaun Watson. These are the teams I want to go to. Colts at five, Dolphins at four. I brought up earlier when we're talking about why professional owners need to be held accountable. What did Deshaun Watson talk about in his post-game press conference to end the season? He was asked, hey, Deshaun, what do you want to see in a head coach? What do you want the, the qualities and the characteristics to be of your next head coach who overtakes over Houston? He said, I want a, a man that can lead us. We need a culture change. We need a leader that can come in here that we can follow behind. Well, paging Miami, paging Miami, uh, Brian Flores, hello. That is the guy. That is the perfect guy that Sean Watson is referencing. The culture that he has built down there in Miami is perfect. It is exactly what Watson is craving. Brian Flores is a leader that he can get behind. He is a head coach that Deshaun Watson, that, that is a culture that has been created. He wants Houston to emulate Miami. I mean, there's no, there's no accident. It's not a coincidence that some of the leaked rumors have been that Deshaun Watson prefers Miami. He prefers going to the Dolphins. Because that culture that Brian Flores has built is exactly what he's looking for. So sure, they need help at the wide receiver position. Right? They, they absolutely could use an upgrade there. I like Devontae Parker, but... Is he a number one wide receiver? Not on the field enough to do so. They need definitely help with the skill positions. But with that said, even if they have to give up trade capital to get to Sean Watson, they still have enough draft picks from previous trades to still be able to address some needs. So to me, Deshaun Watson would be the perfect leader in Miami. That's a team that would have a lot of success. And team that would be on the up and up and be a legitimate Super Bowl contender just next year. So the Colts 5. Dolphins four in terms of teams that I think Deshaun Watson, if I'm him, I want to get traded to. Number three, the Rams. I mean, look, from a, a coaching perspective, just flat out coaching, not player acquisition, not general manager role, but from a, a, an offensive minded perspective, Bill O'Brien was a pretty good head coach. Bill O'Brien is a pretty good play caller. He's a, he's a pretty good schemer when it comes to offense. But imagine now getting Bill O'Brien on steroids going out there to Los Angeles and getting him to play with Sean McVay. I mean, honestly. You talk about an upgrade. Getting to, to play with Sean McVay and the way he's able to scheme offenses, the way he has a quarterback-friendly system. Leaving Houston where it's all on him. Again, it's a one-man show with the Texans. It, it's the Deshaun Watson show. You got to play every single week like, a, like, your career depends on it. And if you do so, maybe the Texans will win. I mean, they won four games this year, and that was all because of hero ball from Deshaun Watson. And if not, if you play slightly below, if you play pretty good but not great, if you play solid but not, you know, elite, this team has no shot of winning. So now you would get traded to the Rams, which they were fourth in, in DVOA and running the ball this past season. A ton of success running the ball. You go to a head coach that wants to establish a run in Sean McVay. You get to work off that. You get to throw to Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, who are reliable wide receivers. That won't be taken away from you, by the way. You get to play with an elite defense for the first time in your career. 
And you get to work with a coach that, I mean, let's be honest here, he took Jared Goff to a Super Bowl. Since that Super Bowl, Jared Goff has stunk. And maybe that's looking more and more like an aberration. So if he took an average quarterback to a Super Bowl, what can he do with Deshaun Watson? So that's why, to me, the Rams are a destination. If I'm Deshaun, I am circling right now on the board saying, get me here. Get me to Los Angeles. Let me play with Sean McVay. Let me have some fun. And, man, if you're the Rams, from their perspective, like I said, it's a no-brainer if you can make it happen anyway. But could you imagine fighting for the L.A. market? Forget just trying to beat the Chargers because they still have you know a hold on that market over the Chargers. But when you're trying to compete with the Dodgers, trying to compete with the, the Lakers, imagine bringing Deshaun Watson to town. Rams have a legitimate case to try to at least be relevant in that market outside of just being relevant compared to the Chargers. They'd be a hot ticket. And for a new stadium that has no fans this year and trying to get fans in the stadium next year, whew, Deshaun Watson is a guy you could easily market to be that guy to get fans in the stadium. So Colts 5, Dolphins 4, Rams 3. We're discussing the top five teams that Deshaun Watson should want to get traded to. If he has control and he has a no trade clause, where should he want to go? Right, Richard Sherman, I just played the clip before in case you, you know, just joining, you missed it. Richard Sherman made the case why Deshaun Watson should want to run to the Jets. Said, I mean, he put it lightly in saying that they need some upgrades. He, <laughs> upgrades to say the least. They need an upgrade in terms of skill position in every single place on offense. Getting Deshaun Watson is not a cure-all. It would basically be, you know, for at least a year or two, assuming Joe Douglas can do his job correctly, it would be a similar situation to what he has down in there in Houston. Not a lot of great talent. An offensive line that's porous. So personally, I think he could do better than the Jets. I think the Colts are a better fit. That's why I have him at five. Dolphins at four. Rams at three. How about this one? Number two, if I'm Deshaun Watson, this is where I want to get traded to. This is where I want to play my football in 2021. New Orleans Saints. Again, just like I talked about with McVay, similar. Imagine him in a, in a Sean Payton offense. I like the way Sean Payton designs games. I like the way he calls games. I like the way he, he schemes up plays. Now think about it. The last few years, I've, my, we've talked about this on the show a ton. Drew Brees has, has lost you know, his fastball. Now could you imagine bringing Deshaun Watson and you immediately replace the downfield threat that was lost for, I'm going to say, the last two and a half years. The last month, five weeks or so, the 2018 season is when really I saw personally Drew Brees start to decline. And that's where the downfield threat really started leaving the Saints offense. So now in one offseason, you can replace that with a great downfield thrower who is aggressive, wants to throw the ball down the field. You go to an offense that, hey, you had DeAndre Hopkins. He was your security blanket. He was your number one guy. He was your biggest threat in the offense. And you get to go to New Orleans, and you basically have DeAndre Hopkins 2.0 and Michael Thomas. Right? Just a vacuum. You throw the ball in the area, boom, this guy's catching it. Now, look, I understand Michael Thomas, not the best ending to 2020, can shut out in that game against the Buccaneers. But look, you hear all the surgeries he's having. He'll come back healthy next year. I mean, th- this is a guy who broke the record for most receptions in one season last year. Michael Thomas will be a beast, a stud, a fantasy football, arguably number one overall pick. And Deshaun Watson is in New Orleans next year. And not to mention... Not only would you have Michael Thomas, who, again, is the same kind of player that you had in Houston with DeAndre Hopkins. You also get to inherit Alvin Kamara, an incredible pass-catching running back. That Guess what? You sort of had Alvin Kamara knockoffs in Houston. You had Duke Johnson. This year, you traded for in that awful trade for DeAndre Hopkins. You traded for David Johnson, who, I mean, injury-prone, guy could barely stay in the field. So now you get a durable legitimate threat in Alvin Kamara. You've had the store brand of Alvin Kamara on the Texans, right? Yeah, the store version. But this is the premium. This is the top shelf. This is the marquee in Alvin Kamara. You get the real thing. Not the store-bought brand. Defense is loaded. A lot of talent on defense. And division, very winnable. I look, obviously... Tom Brady will return in Tampa Bay next year. That team will be another threat. But Carolina, building but not great. Atlanta, I think they're going to go 
in the tank a little bit more. Division is very winnable. Saints would be an awesome landing spot for Deshaun Watson to find him. So top five places we're talking, if you just want to chime in the conversation, get in here. We're talking top five locations for Deshaun Watson. If, if you were him, if you were Deshaun Watson, seeing the landscape of the NFL, where would you want to go next year? Colts five, Dolphins four, Rams three, Saints two. My number one team, if I'm Deshaun Watson, I'm trying my hardest to get there. San Francisco. Get me to the 49ers if I'm Deshaun Watson, and you will be, your hand will be heavy with rings. You wouldn't be able to lift it. Very similar situation to the Rams, but personally, I think a little bit better. I really like Kyle Shanahan. Last year after the Super Bowl, when Andy Reid finally was able to shed the label of the best head coach without a ring, right? He, he finally got his first ring last year, the Chiefs winning. I said, right after the Super Bowl, to me, Kyle Shanahan is the best head coach in the NFL without a ring. I put him ahead of Sean McVay, but ahead of some other coaches, I still think that to this day. So to me, in my mind, you pair Deshaun Watson with the best scheme or the best head coach without a Super Bowl ring in Kyle Shanahan. Man, you talk about a dream come true. Extremely friendly quarterback system. Similar to LA, right? With an average quarterback running the helm right now with Jimmy G. You're able to get rid of him. You're able to upgrade if you're Kyle Shanahan to bring in Deshaun Watson. Holy smokes. Let's not forget, Kyle Shanahan was the offensive coordinator in Atlanta when Matt Ryan won the MVP. So if he could take Matt Ryan and in one year make him an MVP up 20 to 3 in the Super Bowl kind of quarterback, what can he do with Deshaun Watson? Honestly, the sky's the limit. I will be, this, to me, the sky is the limit. The dynasty that San Francisco had back in the 80s, I think, honestly, could be replicated in the 2020 decade. That's how much success I think John Watson could have if he gets traded out there to the Bay. He has George Kittle to throw to, a solid offensive line to block for him, and a legitimate running game and take the pressure off his shoulders. I think the 49ers, if they're able to acquire Deshaun Watson, would be the best possible landing spot for the three-time Pro Bowl quarterback. So in terms of where the best spot for Deshaun Watson is to be, I have Colts at five, Dolphins at four, Rams at three, Saints at two, and number one, I have the 49ers. So I'm curious your thoughts. What is the best landing spot for Deshaun Watson? What is the best situation that he should want to get traded to next year to have the most success going forward? Because, again, this is not about getting the most money. This is about where can I go to win? He's made his money. He has been on a losing team for far too long. Where can he go get his money, get his ring? I think, to me, the best option is San Francisco. So I'm curious your thoughts. Where would Deshaun Watson best be suited to go play next year? What, uh, what team gives him the best shot to win a Super Bowl next year and going forward? Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network. Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter. We'll get your thoughts. And when we come back, Conference Championship Weekend is a few days away. Hickey's Pickies. We will have our guest picker, Liam Naranjo. I'm very excited to have him on. He is going for a chance for history to join an elite club. There's only one person to be able to join this year. That is the undefeated club. We'll see if you can do it next. It is the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome, Welcome back, back to the Ryan Hickey, Ryan Hickey Show. Show. Right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Welcome back into the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Here till 11 a.m. Eastern, top of the hour. But it is a Thursday. That means it is Conference Championship Weekend Edition of Hickey's Pickies. Two games, so not the, you know, the normal big slate we had. But there is a chance for history here. I'm very excited. Our next guy, Liam Naranjo. Chance to join an exclusive club that only currently has just one member. Lee, how you feeling, bud? You ready to make some history today? I'm so ready. I've never been more ready. Uh, let me just start off by saying first time, long time. <laughs> well, we appreciate uh, you coming on. You're the best in the business, number one. 
<laughs> the check is in the mail. I appreciate the kind words. Don't worry. That uh, hopefully you'll be able to cash it. I don't know. You know, funds are a little low, but we'll we'll see what we can do. So, like we said, the, the good news is here, Lee. I'm very excited because. Really, I, I have been a total mush. I, I've warned every single Hickey's Pickies contestant this year. Basically, go the opposite of what I said. And we were talking okay. yesterday. You also consider yourself a mush. So I'm feeling very excited, not just for you personally, but also for me selfishly. Because if we have two mushes, two wrongs do make a right. Uh -huh, two um, negatives, yeah. So if we have see, – uh, see, I can't do anything right now. The music is playing. I have ads playing in the background. So as you can see, I don't do anything right. Now <laughs> we're back. So if you're the mush – if I'm the mush, two mushes have to make a right. So I'm actually feeling pretty good that we will both, as long as we're on the same page here, both okay. crush these picks and go undefeated. How are you feeling? Can we, can we make that a, a possibility or, and a reality here? I'm hoping so. I'm, I'm curious to know what you're thinking on this because I have, I have a certain mindset Ooh. on my picks. Coming um, with a game plan. I like it. Yeah, but I, I made it. As soon as you sent me the spreads, I immediately made my pick. Ooh. And then I was like, I, I think I made my picks too early because now I'm oh, for the last, no. like, last like 24 hours. I'm like, okay, see, maybe I'm not right. I was just going to praise you for your conviction. Wow, I like that. The man who I he know. sees the number, boom, gut instinct. I'm going to take this team. I'm going to take this team. Then just puts it away and, and just doesn't think about it. And now I, oh, you're I having second thoughts. Twitter. Huh? Oh, no. I started scrolling Twitter. Uh-oh. And then I'm getting all the all the insiders saying uh, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes best shape of his life um, talk Ooh. on Twitter. So I, I'd see it's um, you're it's playing been, mind games, huh? Yeah, with myself. Uh huh. Oh boy, that's dangerous. Well, I want to de delay the picks for just a second here because okay. I, I want to have you on also for another reason. We just talked about Deshaun Watson, uh, Watson trade destinations. Richard Sherman okay. says go to the Jets. Lee, you are a Jets fan yourself. Now, this may be a, a stupid question, but I'll ask you here first before I ask my other question. Do you want Sean Watts on your team in 2021? 100%. Okay. What I, would you give up? Four first-round picks for Deshaun Watson. Are you doing it? Um, I don't know if I would do four first-rounders. Maybe see if you could – because they have – I think it's like they have – four over the next two years right? yes so i'd say you want to hold on to at least one of them okay see so if you if you could get him for three and another pick maybe or maybe darnold if they want him i think uh i think you do it what if let's just say so let's say you keep the seahawks picks right so you get their pick this year next year you give your next the jets next four first round picks so you still have, you know, a first-round pick this year at the Seahawks, still a first-round pick next year at the Seahawks, but the Jets' first four or the next mm -hmm. four first-round picks, you give up. So the number two overall pick, gone, and three more after that. Would you do it then? Just the picks, nothing else. Just the picks. Four first-round picks, the Jets' next four first-round picks, but you get to keep the two that you got from Seattle in the Jamal Adams trade. Um, oh, thinking still, hard. I still think – I think you do it. I think I, you, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I, Deshaun Watson is just like I don't know. He, he he's incredible. I think he's got that perfect combination of like throwing and running. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I like what Joe Douglas has been doing so far in the front office. Um, he just hired a great coach who's been getting nothing but praise around the league, and um. They just brought in, and he brought with him a good offensive um, coordinator. So, I mean, if you can get a guy like Deshaun Watson and continue to rebuild that that uh, that offensive line, I mean, that's really all that matters is who's blocking, right? True, if you, true. If you don't have blocking, it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, I think four first-round picks for the Jets, four first-round picks – for Deshaun Watson is something I think they have to do. I, I, Lee, I am with you, man. If I'm the, as a Colts fan, I give up like six. I, I would give almost honestly the farm because you don't really get a guy coming around this often that is just already a bona fide talent that right. another organization that's not the Jets is so incompetent to give away that hey, if you you can feast on just stupidity, I might as yeah. well do it. It's a new era for the Jets. It's a new it era for the like Jets, it. right? It feels like it, but I'll tell you, it, it feels like a new era every four years. Um, <laughs> But to be honest, though, I haven't felt – I haven't really felt 
um, this optimistic about the Jets since probably like peak Rex Ryan era. So, hey, and you don't have the Johnson family making decisions. At least you know that sounds like Joe Douglas hired uh, Sala. So that's I mean that's huge. There you go. He's yeah. He seems he seems completely opposite of Adam Gase. Bald guys, bald guys unite. See if they can uh, yeah right t- turn them around. Yeah, I'm feeling good with the Jets. I think they, they are heading in the right direction for sure. So we'll get those good vibes going. We'll, we'll get some, you know, feel, feeling good, get some blood rushing here. So just as a heads up, Lee. So obviously, you know, we're going to try to get, get you perfect here. So far, mm-hmm. Lauren Clark, the only person in the history of Hickey's Pickies to go a perfect record. Five and wow. out. She is Five it. Five and out. I know. So, but hey, you know what? I'll say this. No one else has gotten a zero in the loss column. So even if you go two and out. A zero in the loss column, Lee, is still a zero in the loss column. You're entering that exclusive club, the undefeated club. So the, the, the opportunity is here. Yeah. And to make you feel a little bit better, we'll, we'll give you some comparisons to how some mutual friends did. Okay. Kroll, two and three. Dan, two and four. Rob and Maldi both one and four. So, mm. I mean, hey, you know, if you're a little right. maybe intimidated about going undefeated – your your friend your your friendly competition here hasn't done well at all, so that should hopefully give you a little bit of boost as well. All right, all right. So I mean, even if I win one, my win percentage is still better. Oh, you you crush you crush all of them. That yeah. that's it. We'll, we'll go for one and one, mm-hmm. and you can have bragging rights over them for the next year until uh, the next Hickey's Pickies comes around. How about that? That's perfect. So, two games: Buccaneers, Packers, Bills, Chiefs. We'll go in time order. So we'll we'll go in the NFC. We'll go to frigid Lambeau Field. 28 degrees is going to be on Sunday. Maybe some snow showers. Buccaneers getting three points on the road at the Packers. Lee, what are you feeling for this game? Uh, for this one, I felt pretty good about taking the Packers. Um, always in my head, always a huge uh, point when a f- hot weather team goes and plays a cold weather team especially in the playoffs. And the Bucks are obviously Florida, South Florida. <laughs> yes. Hot weather all year. <laughs> Going up to Lambeau in the, in the, the frozen tundra. It's going to snow. The frozen tundra. I think, uh, I think Green Bay gets it done. So that, you sound pretty confident. So that's safe to say that's a pick that you made yesterday afternoon yes. and did not waver on. No. I that love one it. I feel that one feel good about you feel good about it you're the mush i feel good about it i'm the mush two wrongs are going to make it right here we are getting this pick right i am with you packers laying the three points no problem at all. i understand tom brady you know mr postseason the guy is incredible don't get me wrong but to your point more weather team the rest of the team outside of tom brady loves playing that 75 degrees down there in tampa bay good luck trying to go to a frigid uh green Bay pa- or green uh lambo field easy for me to say catch the ball mike evans good luck trying to do that that's number one and number two, I mean, who's stopping this Packers offense? The Rams had the best defense in the NFL, and they got shredded last week. Shredded. So, sure, the, the Buccaneers' defense looked good against you know, Drew Brees. But honestly, I mean, that guy's a corpse out there at this point. So you are not going against a corpse in Aaron Rodgers. This Packers offense is humming. I think it continues on Saturday or Sunday, I should say. And I'm with you. Packers lane three. No doubt about it. We are both on the Packers minus three, which for two people that are wrong, that is, that is a good thing. I'm feeling good about that pick. Okay. Game number two. Bills going to Arrowhead. This game also three-point spread. The Bills are getting three, so both road teams getting three points here. This one sounds like, because you referenced earlier, you, you're looking at some uh, reports about Patrick Holmes' health. You are starting to waver on this pick. So let, let's hear what's going through the Liam Naranjo yeah. brain right now. So uh, what well, was bailed out by the uh, temperature um, difference here? They're both cold-weather teams. Um, probably more so. Probably... The cold weather definitely gives the Bills the advantage because, um, you know, nobody circles the wagons like the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> um, I initially liked the Bills for this one. Okay. And uh, I'm going to – it's it's so hard to pick against the Kansas City Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes under center. Um but I think I'm going to have to stick with the Buffalo Bills. Wow. Circle in the wagons. Bills Mafia, you're breaking some tables. You are going with Josh Allen and the Bills on the road. Plus three. Or, uh, yeah, plus, plus three, three on the road. Taking the um, points. 
I like the Bills. They're they're uh, the Bills are frisky. Frisky. Lee Lee is getting frisky now. He had he had some waivers, had some doubts, but he is coming in here strong. Sick of this initial thoughts going with the Bills. I'm going to go the opposite here. I apologize. We couldn't agree on both. Um, but I'm going to go with the Chiefs. I think this is a team that, honestly, I just trust to get it done. They faced adversity last year. They're down, you know, in every playoff game they came back. They had Chad Henney at quarterback for the last quarter and a half. Still won the game. And Chad Henney won the game. I mean, the third down scramble, incredible, obviously, passing on fourth down to, to ice the game against the Browns last week. To me, in my mind, that was the best opportunity for anyone in the AFC to knock the Chiefs out. Patrick Holmes out of the game for a quarter and a half. That was your opportunity. It came and went. Browns didn't capitalize. I personally don't think that the Bills are going to go into Kansas City and win. Their offense definitely does scare me a little bit with how just Baltimore kind of pushed around last week. You can blame the wind if you want, but Josh Allen didn't play well. Um, that Bills defense did play well. Don't get me wrong. But it is a different task going against Lamar Jackson and that Baltimore uh, offense last week. And now trying to slow down Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey and maybe Clyde edwards helaire if he plays. And Sammy Watkins is a third or fourth option. I trust Patrick Holmes. I trust Andy Reid. So I think, honestly, in this situation, the Chiefs, I understand they haven't really played great either. You know, they played a lot of close games in the regular season and obviously, you know, played another close one um, last week. But I will lay the three. I think the Chiefs get it done. And I do think that they cover at home and go to the Super Bowl. So, hey, we, we agree in one. We're both on the Packers minus three. You are taking the Bills. You are circling the wagons. For Bills plus three, I'm taking the Chiefs minus three. Lee, I, I'm rooting for you, man. I really hope you do join the, the exclusive club because Lauren has given me a headache. She's bragging about it every single day that, you know, she is the best. No one can, can uh, get it on her level. And we won't tell her how many games you pick, but I'll just tell her, hey, Liam went undefeated as well. No big deal. Maybe get, yeah. you know, get, get a little real good? estate there. Yeah. She the change. <laughs> So, keep the change. <laughs> um, Love that saying. I, I don't know why, yeah. but keep the change is one I want to work in more. I like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Something, something. Uh, when I saw it, just immediately in my head, Buffalo Bills, hide your tables. <laughs> oh man, um, that, if you are a ta- honestly, I might just like buy up a bunch of tables and move to Buffalo for two weeks if they win on bad Sunday. Bad day to be a table. Holy yeah. cow. Though, I know it's a pandemic, man. Those pan, those, those table sellers, they are. They might retire if, oh, if, yeah. if the Bills your, make a Super Bowl run. Get your get your table stands ready in <laughs> Buffalo because <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna be selling out. Like, it's like the drive up to Buffalo. All it is just like roadside table stands. Get tables, your tables yeah. here. Yep. A- authentic Buffalo Bills plastic tables. Tables for sale. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Lee, we appreciate you coming on, buddy. Best of luck. I'm rooting for you going undefeated. I'm glad we agree on one. The Mushes hopefully at least get one right. And you go one and one. Hey, the best winning percentage of all our friends. So that's something to, to walk away with as well. Best of luck. Enjoy the games this weekend. Thanks for giving us a few minutes here, bud. Uh, Ryan Hickey, thank you. You're the best in the business, like I said. <laughs> Number one. Thanks for having me, man. Lee, thanks for coming on. Now with two comments, i got to pay you double the money. So I'll try to get there at some point. No promises, but I'll try my I'll, best to have I'll those. be looking for it. All right, I'll be looking for it. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. You are the man. Lee Naranjo. He He's a self-acclaimed mush. I am a self-proclaimed mush. We both agree in the Packers. I'm feeling good about the Packers. He's taking the Bills. He's going Bills Mafia. I will go Chiefs. And that will do it for Hickey's Pickies. Appreciate Lee coming on. Give us a few minutes here. Appreciate everyone who tuned in. On this Thursday, hopefully you made your, your Thursday morning a little bit brighter, a little bit cheerier, at least for the last two hours. So enjoy all of the games, or I guess both of these games, not a lot, but enjoy both games this weekend. Should be a lot of fun. Can't wait to talk about who's going to the Super Bowl when we reconvene back on Monday. So between now and then, have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay sane. We'll talk to you on Monday, as you always do right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network.